The topic is going to be terraforming, and what I'm going to do is run through probably a 25-30 minute presentation, then let my fellow panelists uh, have, have a word or two, and at, then at that point we'll uh, open it up for questions. That's, yeah. Okay, so that, that looks good. So without further ado, uh, okay, we're talking uh, terraforming, and next slide. Uh, terraforming literally means earth shaping, the process by which a planet, moon, rogue world is made earth-like and by implications a world capable of supporting earth life. Making a planet over into an earth-like planet, uh, the creating of habitable worlds. Next. Uh, concept, uh, you know, again it appeared in science fiction, uh, Ulf Stapleton's uh, Last and First Man, 1930. Uh, was where the concept first appeared. Jack Williamson gave it the, the name terraforming in his uh, book Collision Orbit 1942. The first actual technical paper of course was uh, Carl Sagan in 1961 and NASA published uh, Proceedings in uh, 1976 and since then there have been a number of papers and uh, books uh, published on on the subject so it's a uh, field that is, is developing you know pretty nicely and uh, there, there's a lot of a lot of good data out there. Uh, next. This is a, a pretty image, uh, you know, nice place to live, but, but think in terms of this picture being taken on Mars or, or Venus and, and you get some idea of, of what we're after when we talk about terraforming. Venus would have a little work. Venus would have a little work, and, and we'll talk about that later, yes, yes. Okay, next slide. Uh, when I give a presentation on terraforming, one of the questions I usually get is why terraform at all? Uh, it's unnecessary, difficult, expensive, unethical, dangerous, uh, takes entirely too long. Uh, there are legal and economic issues, uh, you know, who owns Venus at this point? Uh, space settlements are just better. You know, why terraform a planet when you can build a space settlement? Next. And space settlements can look pretty nice. Uh, here's some images from uh, NASA. This is an O'Neill cylinder. Next. And yeah, here's a, a graphic of, uh, you know, a space settlement being built. Uh, you're mining the asteroids to build a settlement. Next. And here again, you're, you're moving the asteroids to a position where you want to mine them. Next. And here's uh, some images of what such a settlement like look, uh, might look like on the inside. Next. And notice the waterfall. Uh, space settlements can be actually very, uh, very nice places to live. Next. You know, again, a, a nice view. Next. Uh, notice the golf course. So. Complete with sand, perhaps. So again, space settlements in theory can be pretty nice places to, to live, and if we can build space settlements, uh, again, why go through the effort and trouble of, of terraforming? Was that named for Kalpanachala? Hmm? Was that named for Kalpanachala? I'm sure. Probably, probably. Sorry, okay. she was, she was of mine. Oh, really? Wow, okay. Next. Uh, one of the problems that you know people engaged in space travel and space settlements are going to have to address is uh, space radiation. Uh, different studies have been done. If you're looking strictly at solar radiation, that's uh, protons, electrons, you know, alpha particles, some, some gamma. And a NASA study looked at that pretty closely and said if you have uh, 550 grams per square centimeter, uh, you have pretty good uh, shielding. Uh, it'll keep your radiation exposure to you know, half, half a rim per year. So we have a good handle on the, the solar wind. Cosmic radiation is composed of uh, protons, heavy ions mainly, and for those you need a little bit more shielding and uh, I guess the estimate uh, that I've come up with is, or studies that I have looked at have come up with is a thousand grams per square centimeter. If, and if all you're doing is using, is throwing mass in front of it. If all you're doing is throwing mass in, in front of it, correct, yeah. There, there's other approaches, you know, like uh, magnetic fields, but yeah, strictly with mass uh, you, you won't you know, quantities, you know, fairly big quantities for this. And water is actually ideal uh, for, for the mass that you, you put in front of it. But the problem you run into is relativistic heavy ions. 
Uh, they had recorded uh, alpha particles at the surface of the Earth uh, coming in from space with energies equivalent to a baseball traveling softball. at uh, a softball traveling at 60 miles an hour. You know, this is one. This is one, one nucleus. Particle. One <laughs> nucleus, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this one made it all the way to the surface of, of the Earth. You know, when you're standing around and suddenly you see a flash of light, that's probably something pretty heavy, you know, running through your eyeball. Seriously, the, yep. the, the eye's capable of picking it up. Sharon if, you've ever, if you've ever been in a dark room, and, and just an absolutely dead dark room, and seen a sudden pinpoint flash of light, you've just seen a cosmic ray. Astronauts saw lots of them. Now, we have a pretty good handle on radiation that, that comes from, from fission because of uh, our experience with uh, nu nuclear power plants. But we don't have a lot of experience with relativistic heavy ions. Uh, they're looking at some studies uh, indicating that these things do significant damage to a, a brain if it travels through it. You know, one atom traveling through your, your brain can leave thousands of uh, brain cells, you know, dying behind. So they, they do have uh, cognitive uh, effects on astronauts. Uh, we've experimented with mice and the results are not encouraging. And to uh, guard against uh, relativistic heavy ions is going to take more than a, a thousand grams per square centimeter. You're probably looking at uh, magnetic shielding, uh, double shields, uh, distance, and a lot more Artificial mass. Artificial Van Allen builds. So if someone is uh, you know, postulating a, a, a solar settlement, uh, space settlement, then this is one of the areas that they need to address pretty pretty carefully. And of course we have gamma ray bursts. We think those uh, account for one or two of the mass extinctions that have occurred here on Earth. And they, they may account for the Fermi paradox solution. And those things are, are pretty dangerous. Again, you need a lot of mass to uh, protect yourself from a gamma ray burst. And if it's big enough and close enough, you know, even that probably won't do. Next. That, that's mainly for solar storms. Yeah, it, it's not. It's it's not going to do diddly against no. this other stuff. Yeah, if you had a cosmic ray burst, most of them only last a few seconds. You you have no warning, and you receive what hundreds, thousands of rim in just a little bit of time. So if you're in your storm shelter, it won't do you any good. Uh, the other argument I have is, okay, we don't need to terraform anything because we'll just go out in space and we'll find uh, preformed planets. Uh, planets are common, you know, that's a fact. Uh, we seem to be finding them everywhere we look. Life may be fairly common. Again, that's an open question. We don't know. That's a real good reason to go to Mars and, and uh, Titan and Neptune and, and you know, let, let's see what's out there. You know, is life common or not? We, we don't know. Uh, Earth-sized worlds and the star's habitable zone, again, if you have enough uh, stars to look at, may actually be pretty common. You know, in Star Trek, they couldn't <laughs> go more than a far sector two before they found uh, an in-class planet, uh, so they must be pretty common. So the, uh, the idea is, you know, just go out there, find one, move in, hey, life is good. But, uh, next. Oh, yeah, here, here's a cute cartoon that uh, our, our president, John Preston, came up with. So yeah, that's that's the idea. You, you find a nice planet, you just you know move in. Hey, life is good, but uh, ah, there are problems. The, the trouble is when you go somewhere, you bring yourself with you. Yeah. yeah. No matter where you go, there you are. Okay, we have to take a little sidebar here because you know it it, it is relevant. Uh, all life is all Earth life is based on uh, DNA. DNA is based on four nucleotides. Uh, I I think of it T C A G. And they form pairs, A, C, T, G, you know, and that forms the uh, genetic spiral. And uh, these pairs, you know, this, this is our DNA, you know, literally is composed of these four letters. And they contain instructions for assembling proteins and, and some other information. Next. Um, proteins are important. Uh, without them, hey, we're, we're, we're not here. Uh, but a transcription em enzyme, ba basically a, a, a molecular machine, runs up and down the, the DNA 
uh, reads the DNA and creates essentially a punch tape. Uh, if it runs across an A, it you know puts an A. If it runs across a C, puts a C. G for G. But then there's another nucleotide, U for T. So uh, you know there's something odd going on there. And this uh, messenger RNA floats around until it finds another molecular machine that then reads it like a punch tape and assembles a protein, uh, one amino acid uh, at, at a time. And it, it reads this punch tape three letters at a time. So that gives you 64 possible words. So this machine can take 64 possible instructions about what, what to do. But it turns out that three of those are stop commands and many others are redundant, a few aren't used. Uh, thus we only use 20 um, uh, amino acids um, you know, to make all the proteins that we're, we're made out of. Nine of these amino acids are essential. You've heard the term essential amino acids. Uh, they can't be made by the human body. You have to uh, ingest them. Next. Uh, proteins, uh, you know, the structural elements, uh, regulators, catalysts, uh, whatever the cell does, it's done with proteins. And all earth proteins are composed of those 20 um, amino acids uh, there's a few others that somehow get in there. I think they're associated with the, uh, uh, the mitochondria. Mm. So, but there's 500 amino acids out there. And the question is, is, is it just luck that we picked those particular 20 or 23? Uh, and it kind of, to me, looks like it is. Okay, next. Now imagine life that evolved on an alien world. Uh, alien proteins. Even if it were based on our four DNA nucleotides, they, they could uh, interpret those uh, letters very differently. And there was a research group uh, at Scripps in California that came up with two new letters and they inserted it into the DNA of a bacteria. And so that bacteria has six letters. You know, that they don't do anything, but, uh, or those two extras don't do anything, but they've been stable, I think, last time I heard, over 30 generations. So there's nothing apparently very special about the nucleotides that uh, make up our, our DNA. Uh, so if it reads it three letters at a time, you know, six to the third is 216 possible instructions. And if a really advanced uh, organism uh, reads four letters at a time, it's got, uh, you know, over 1,200, almost 1,300 instructions that it could use for uh, assembling proteins. Alien life. Um, you know, if we landed on such a planet, uh, we're probably immune to its viruses and parasites, you know, just because it's a different, uh, different life form. Uh, the allergens and toxins may be a different story, and that's a two-way street. It'd be embarrassing to land in paradise and then have it die as you breathed on it. Uh, if it turns out that uh, the life on the planet it is... Today. It's, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. If it turns out that uh, we land on an alien planet and the life is based on essentially uh, Earth uh, DNA instructions, then, then there's a lot of uh, questions we, we need to begin to ask, you know, like, like why. One possible answer to that is called uh, panspermia, the idea that life uh, evolved or was created at one spot and spread throughout space to, uh, you know, colonize all the planets. So if that theory turns out to be correct, um, the Star Worlds type, Star Worlds? Star, Star Trek. World, Star Treks, yeah. Uh, where they all kind of look. Where same. they all kind of look in, uh, look alike and could eat each other, you know, that, that begins to look possible. But panspermia, I think, is, is kind of far-fetched. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going on the assumptions that, you know, life evolves on, on each planet. And Arguably, you could get some some crossover within a stellar system. Right. But right. Uh, yeah. But from star to star, I mean, just thinking about the distances involved, yeah, very very unlikely. So, we may find life in this solar system that's based on our DNA system. You know, one theory is that we're Martians actually. Uh, but if you go to a different star, which is you know where you would want to set up home, or set up a second home, it, it may be very different. Uh, they may not have the essential amino acids that we need, and then what's the effects of uh, excessive um, uh, amino acids that we are not used to using? Uh, we don't know. Okay, so given that uh, little sidebar, you know, let's assume that the top one is Earth. Uh, we live here, this is our planet, uh, we're comfortable here. And down below on the uh, left is a living world. 
that we find, say, floating around Alpha Centauri. Uh, it's, it's a living world and by definition, uh, there's oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, there, there's life on the planet, uh, something is producing that oxygen. But if we land on it, we run into the possibility that it may not like us, we may not, may not like it, we may not be able to, uh, uh, to farm, that there's going to be a conflict. That there's ethical questions, you know, if we uh, stop its evolution, uh, you know, suppose there's a small monkey-like creature there, uh, you know, and we take over, uh, you know, is, is that a good thing? So what I would propose is that the planet on the right, you know, it's Earth size, assume it's in the habitable zone, you know, that's the planet that we should be looking at. And to make it Earth-like, we're going to have to terraform it. Okay, next. Uh, terraforming in seven simple steps. Uh, first, you would want to survey the planet. Is there life there? Is there something else there that you need to know about? What kind of resources does it have? And step two, if necessary, hit it with a big rock. Uh, in order to adjust its orbit, adjust its spin rate. Mars actually happens to have uh, a day cycle which is pretty close to, uh, to Earth. Uh, what, 24 hours, 30 minutes or some yeah. cycle? Uh, almost 40 minutes. 40 minutes, yeah. okay. But, you know, it, it's which close enough uh, for us. But uh, Merc or, or Venus, on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, its day is well, good grief. Too. Almost it's equal to its year. Almost. No, yeah, not quite. It, it, it spins very slowly. So you would want to spin that one up. And also it turns out that, uh, at least with Venus, it, it's relatively flat. So you would want to sculpt the surface. And that's where you use smaller rocks to, uh, to do that. Uh, okay, what you've got is spinning at the right rate and in the right orbit. Uh, you would want to adjust the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere. And then at that point, you want to adjust the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, import water for oceans, um, establish a hydrodynamic cycle, and then, you know, comes a really difficult part, which is uh, making sterile soil live. You know, the, the soil we walk on, uh, we, we take it for granted, but it's a very, very complex system. And to create that out of nothing is not going to be a, a trivial task. Uh, so once we have uh, the soil uh, you know, surviving, uh, import plants, insects, animals. And at that point, uh, you've got yourself a terraform world. Now this could take, you know, in a lot of science fiction books, it's, uh, you know, a few decades, but, you know, the studies I've looked at, they're talking thousands of years to, to run through this process, and that's assuming fairly advanced technology. Uh, next. And let's see, here's the uh, phase diagram of water. Uh, showing temperature on the bottom, pressure on, on the top. Uh, Earth uh, represents, well, let's see here, this little area. Mars is down here and Venus is up here. Next. So if you want to terraform Venus, you've got to reduce the temperature, reduce the pressure, bring it into an Earth-like region. And with Mars, you want to increase the pressure, increase the temperature to bring it into an Earth-like region. Next. Uh, our atmosphere, you know, it's mainly nitrogen, 78% nitrogen, 21% uh, oxygen, about 1% argon, a little CO2. Uh, plants need nitrogen. You, you can't dispense with that. Uh, we need oxygen, so we don't want to dispense with that. Argon, as near as I can tell, is pretty useless, so we could actually dispense with that, replace that with nitrogen. Uh, but, you know, that's not absolutely known for, for certain yet. Any thoughts? You know, people and animals uh, and plants seem to live very comfortably without argon. But, I mean, uh, it is a light, noble gas. Yeah. Xen xenon can sometimes form compounds, but that's just because it's such a huge atom. You know, it's got yeah. orbitals way the heck out there, but argon? It's just kind of a neutral, fine, it's, yeah. it's a filler. <laughs> gets in the way, yeah. yeah. So, we, we, we could dispense with our, uh, argon, probably. Now, we have a little bit of CO2 in uh, the atmosphere. Uh, we can't get rid of that. That's very important to, uh, to the, plants. The plants have to have CO2. Yeah, if, if you succeed in stopping all CO2 production on this planet, uh, the plants will die, we will die, and we're in big trouble at that point. So CO2 is, is, is pretty crucial, you know, and it's important to have the right amount. So, all right. And then there's water vapor in there as well. And all of this needs to be at one atmosphere, you know, 14.7 PSI. 
And at that point, you've got atmosphere, you know, like, well, like what we find in this room. Okay, next. Photosynthesis. Um, about two and a half billion years ago, a clever bacteria figured out how to uh, make carbohydrates. And it took water, CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, photons from the sun, and created uh, carbohydrates and oxygen. Carbohydrates are very useful to plants uh, for energy and uh, structures inside. Uh, plants are only three to six percent efficient at using the light that falls on them. Uh, they use about a on Earth today. They use about 130 terawatts of power. You know that's a lot of power, uh, even at that low efficiency. They absorb a lot of carbon, and they cause the great oxygen catastrophe that occurred 2.3 billion years ago. So it took them, uh, you know, 200. What is it? 200 million years. 200 million years for uh, this little bacteria to cause a great disaster here on uh, the planet. Because if you breathe methane, having free oxygen around is no good at all. Yeah, that could so be bad. Be okay, next. And here's the, the little guy that caused all of the, the problems. Uh, he destroyed most of the anaerobic life uh, that was, you know, pretty well common on, on the earth at the time. O2 reacted with uh, the methane that was in the atmosphere. Methane is a great uh, global warming gas. And it, uh, as a result, it re uh, caused global cooling. Uh, Huron, Huron glaciation was the result, and that lasted for 300 million years. You've heard of Snowball Earth? Okay. This little guy caused it. Uh, he pretty well covered the planet with uh, ice, so there wasn't a lot of plants uh, producing uh, or using CO2 or, or releasing oxygen. And killed itself. Almost. Well, well pretty close. Pretty close. Uh, the only thing that saved us was uh, CO2 production from uh, volcanoes. Because there weren't a whole lot of plants and because there wasn't a whole lot of rain, the CO2 continued to build up and build up and, you know, eventually got the levels where they were able to, to melt the uh, the, gla the glaciers and, and the ice and uh, the plants reestablished themselves and, and here we are today. So uh, it's a pretty, you know, pretty interesting story, uh, but it takes a long time for natural processes to work. Uh, next, photosynthesis. Uh, here, you know, apparently right now we have uh, two types of uh, uh, photosynthesis. Uh, both of them use similar uh, light spectrums, you know, blue and, and red. Uh, they don't use green, that's why plants are green. Uh, they, they reflect the green, but they absorb everything else. Uh, one thing worth noting is the photosynthesis needs both spe spectrums, you know, both the, the blue and the red to function. So if you just planted seeds on a world surf, uh, circling a red giant, you would have plenty of the red light, uh, but you won't have enough blue for it to, to function well. Yeah, and it's kind of weird that they're green because what's the most common light in the sun? Green. Yellow green. And that's mm -hmm. the one they don't use. So it's something we don't understand about photosynthesis either. Yeah, okay, next. Uh, again, I talked about dirt. Uh, soil food web is a very, very complex uh, system. One that I'm not sure we fully appreciate e even today. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail on this other than to point out that it is a complex system and establishing it from nothing is going to be a, a real challenge for the future terraformers and it may take again thousands of years to to succeed. Uh, next, uh, just a you know, quick note about the nitrogen cycle. You know, th this is one of many, many cycles. Uh, let's start here where you have plants uh, you know, plants die, uh, drop organic uh, material into the soil. Uh, plants are eaten by animals. Animals drop organic material into the soil. Uh, that soil has proteins. There's a particular bacteria that eats these proteins and produces ammonia. There's another type of bacteria that eats the ammonia and produces uh, nitrite. Another uh, bacteria that eats that and produces nitrates. And plants then use the nitrates. So it's a very, very complex cycle, and how you establish this, uh, essentially from nothing, again, is going to be a big challenge for the future terraformers. Uh, next. Plate tectonics. Uh, mentioned before, CO2 production from volcanoes. Um, CO2 in the atmosphere is absorbed by plants. It's also absorbed by rain. 
uh, carbonic acid, uh, you know, falls down onto the land, uh, very, you know, slightly acidic, uh, dissolves rocks, uh, carb yeah, nice carbonates, nice yeah, you have uh, magnesium carbonates, uh, calcium carbonates that uh, then get washed into the ocean. Uh, but with plate, tecto plate tectonics, these uh, magnesium carbonates, uh, potassium, uh, magnesium carbonates um, get subducted and because we have active plate tectonics, uh, they're essentially cooked, releasing the CO2 back into the atmosphere through volcanoes. If it wasn't for plate tectonics, uh, you know, we'd probably still be a frozen snowball. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, Mars, you know, it doesn't have plate tectonics. Venus apparently doesn't have plate tectonics. Uh, and so from a terraforming perspective, you're going to have to deal with uh, CO2 production for, for the plants. So, but, for, but for plate tectonics, we'd be like in life making, turning carbon dioxide gas into solid carbonates. We'd be like Venus because there's as much carbon here as there is on Venus. Only our carbon is in the form of rock, and their carbon is in the form of air. Right. <coughs> so, yeah, we owe a lot to plate tectonics. And also, plate tectonics uh, indicates a molten core, which provides a magnetic shield, which is important okay. for protection of uh, life on uh, the surface of the world. It also protects our atmosphere from being stripped off. So. So it's a bummer when a volcano goes off in your backyard, but it's better for everyone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, next. We all. It depends on the size of the volcano. <laughs> and I was talking to Stephanie about this earlier. Um, question of gravity, you know, all of us, uh, our plants, our animals, us, you know, we've evolved in a 1G environment. We have some experience with the International Space Station uh, with microgravity or zero gravity. But it's not real positive. Uh, one researcher said that uh, the effects of zero gravity mimic, uh, in a lot of respects, the uh, process of accelerated aging. You know, you get weak. Uh, you start I, losing muscle density, you start losing bone density. You have eyesight problems. So zero G doesn't do, you know, we don't do real well in zero G. Um, so where, where's that point where humans can live very comfortably uh, in reduced gravity and, and when do we cross the line where we run into problems. We don't have a lot of experience in, in, in that realm. We can't create uh, microgravities on, on Earth. We have to go into space and that's one reason to uh, create a space station where we can begin to experiment and see how well humans do with reduced gravity. And if you go to Mars, what is that, 30, 34% gravity? 38. You know, 38 percent. That may be too little for a human colony uh, to survive on Mars. So terraforming Mars may, may present problems. Maybe not. You know, it's an open question. We just don't know. Uh, Venus, on the other hand, is about 90 percent gravity on, on the surface. So Venus is, is probably a, a good candidate for a future human colony. But we just need more experience and, and you know, right now it's an open question. Uh, next. Okay, Venus. If we wanted to terraform Venus, again, we'd have to shorten the, uh, the Venetian day. You know, currently it's 116 Earth days. Uh, we'd have to carve out ocean uh, basins. You know, that's where hitting it with a big rock comes in, build mountains and continents. Uh, reduce the... What happened on the other side from the ocean basin? Yeah, hey, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, build mountains, continents, uh, reduce the atmospheric pressure. Right now it's about 95 atmospheres on the, the surface. And so we want to get that down to one and reduce the uh, surface temperature from uh, yeah, 850 Fahrenheit. You think it's hot outside? Yeah, yeah just, just go to Venus. And import a lot of CO, or export CO2. And oddly enough, uh, Venus has four times more nitrogen than it really needs. So, or, or four atmospheres worth of uh, nitrogen. So there's gonna have to export, you're gonna have to export a lot of nitrogen from uh, Venus to make it uh, usable. They could, they could get really rich. Yeah, Nitrogen's yeah. rare in the solar system. Yeah, but uh, Venus has a bunch of it. And you're going to have to import a lot of oxygen and, uh, and water. So terraforming is not just, you know, setting up a little factory on a planet and coming back in 100 years. It's going to be importing, uh, 
gigatons of, of teratons. material. Teratons. Is teratons. Big of, chunks of things. Big chunks of things. Lots of water, lots of oxygen, which we have plenty of in the outer solar system. So, Good basis for trade. Yeah. It, it's going to take a long time to terraform a world, and I think a lot of uh, science fiction books, or at least the ones that I've read, you know, kind of skip over that step and assume, okay, we'll build a terraforming planet here and come back in a few decades and we're, we're good to go. Well, unless we have some kind of magic technology, we're going to have to realize it's going to take thousands of years to terraform a, a world. Uh, okay, next. And... <laughs> The dinosaurs survived on this world for you know, hundreds of, what, 100, and, 100 million years? No, more than 100. More than 100. From 200 to 200 million years ago to 65 million years ago. So 135 million years. Yeah, and if they didn't have that really bad day 65 million years ago, they'd probably still be here. So there's, there's reasons. The ride is going, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Hey, what is that? Yeah. So, Someone was throwing small rocks. <laughs> uh huh. Well, hey, yeah, okay, that's you. Uh, oh, the Vogons, hyperspace <laughs> bypass. You, you've got the plot of a good uh, science fiction book right there. Uh, okay, well, that uh, that's pretty well the the presentation that I was going to run through, and at this point, I'd like to introduce my panelists here. I'm Stephanie Osborne. Uh, I'm one of the rocket scientists here. About probably most of you already know me. Um, I worked uh, in, uh, with NASA and DOD for a couple of decades. Lost a friend on board Columbia, so I quit doing that and started writing books. Okay, Robert? And uh, you all know me, I'm Robert Kennedy, and this is my, this is my <coughs> co-author. And uh, we just had a, a, um, a sort of quasi, this ain't quite terraforming, but shell worlds, which is an idea you heard about. Put a, put a balloon around a planet. And um, he invented that technique, and it is, it is new in science fiction, and it's new in engineering. I mean, it's completely new. We've invented other stuff, he has, that it turned out other people invented, but Shell Worlds was truly brand new. Jabis published it in 2009, and then um, just, uh, what, three weeks ago? Three this weeks, This showed yeah. up in the mail. We looked at the physics of Shell Worlds again. So, um, yeah, we, we write about... Uh, crazy, neat stuff, and um, let's see, what's the connection to, let's say, a student of Robert Heinlein, um, I'm going to be on the H.G. Wells panel later this weekend, and I spent a year working for the House Subcommittee on Space. Never lost my love for it, hence the interstellar, which we all found it. Okay, let's get into some know, questions and answers. Well, well before, we, before we go into questions, I'd like to give my fellow panelists an opportunity to, you know, just give their thoughts on terraforming and is a good thing ethical, uh, doable? Uh, it's doable. Um, maybe not necessarily with exactly the technology that we've got right this instant, uh, but certainly with the with the technology that we have available to us to build. Uh, yeah, it's doable. Um, it's um, the ethics. It, it kind of depends on the situation. Um, I really think that if you can ascertain that the planet does not have life, uh, go for it. Um, I think the biggest problem that we're going to have is the same one that we have with all of our space projects, and that is political willpower. So. And I would second that, uh, you know, as long as you're dealing with a sterile world, or a world that's, you know, clearly not going anywhere, then I think there's really no ethical issues as far as terraforming. But if you are dealing with a living world, you know, with uh, you know, monkeys or dinosaurs running around, it's probably or best just to, uh, just to leave them alone and, and go somewhere else. And, and maybe someone has done that to us. We, we don't really want to turn into uh, the, our version of Galactus. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Robert? Yeah. Um, and life. It doesn't have to be monkeys and dinosaurs. It could be slime. NASA feels the same way. They plunged the Galileo spacecraft into the atmosphere of Jupiter rather than taking even a small risk that the thing might collide with Europa by accident because Europa might host life. And that's a really important question 
to answer for sure is it did it evolve separately in the solar system you know was there two origin events or more that'd be really good to know that's a really important question so why screw it up by accident by contaminating the experiment so they dove that spacecraft into Jupiter so as not to contaminate the experiment and I think as we grow up and as we get rich and go out there and do these giant projects, go to another system maybe, we'll, we'll have ethics about if it's even slime mold, leave it alone. Who knows what it'll become in a couple billion years. And besides, it looks like there may be a lot of sterile worlds out there to, to work with. That's but okay, question uh, questions, well, sir? My question kind of came up when you were talking about Europa, you know, Europa, of course, NASA recently announced they were going to be working on Europa yep. probe, but how do you look for life on Europa without accidentally contaminating it? I mean, it's, that's going to be very difficult because they, bacteria can live in space. Yep. Certain it's, ones can, you know, extremophiles mostly. It's, it's well, um, so uh, there's a mission that was proposed to, you know that little moon around Saturn, Enceladus, that's got the South Pole that's spraying out? So I saw a mission proposal, not, not a giant mission like Galileo, but a smaller Discovery class, class mission to fly through the vapor trail shooting out of the South Pole, fly through and collect whatever is in the vapor trail and then bring it back and have a look because they figure if there's some kind of bacterial life in that lens shaped ocean under the thick ice then in those geysers that life is going to get sucked along with it hopefully you know cross your fingers and when you fly through the plume maybe you'll pick up some you know human beings are very good I mean we're incredibly good at measuring incredibly small amounts of stuff these days you know stuff down in the parts per trillion level so yeah but one, one thing NASA has been doing uh, whenever they send a probe to another planet is they do their best to sterilize the probe yeah uh, you know they take incredible precautions and Stephanie can you know yeah. perhaps talk about that uh, yeah the, the the clean rooms and stuff they they go to extreme measures to avoid cross contamination or back contamination. Um, so yeah, um, it's it's pretty awesome to see what they do. Can we say it's 100% uncontaminated? No, we can't. But it's as darn close as we can get it. That's done to protect the electronics in the first place. The, the <coughs> sterilization is a side benefit, not to mention those are all exposed to hard vacuum and deep space radiation. But the chance of contamination is low. It's very, very low. It's low, but a big the big surprise from Apollo was hard vacuum and space radiation didn't completely kill stuff. That was an eye opener. Yeah, yeah, but also it was only a few days worth of travel time. If you're going to Mars, if you're going to Enceladus, you're talking about months to years sure. of exposure. So that that's when, that's going to cut things down when they when they talk about kill doses you know ld90 that kills 90 percent of the stuff and then you hit it with more radiation kills 99 then 99.9 you can go six nines you can go nine nines the point is you can't go to one that's you true. get very very close to one but you never actually get there so okay other questions We, yeah, that's uh, apparently a, a possibility, but what about all the rest of uh, Earth life? You know, I, I, one, one of the reasons for terraforming is that we can bring, you know, the monkeys and the dolphins and, uh, and the tuna with us and, and provide a, a home for them. Uh, morally, you, you know, you can make the argument that, uh, hey, they supported us, you know, for all these millennia, maybe we need to help them out. Um, but yeah, modifying us to live in other environments, you know, that, that's another approach. But, uh, you know, if you're talking about terraforming, you know, creating Earth-like environments for humans as well as all of the life that we're familiar with. And that brings up the, the question, okay, suppose you're getting ready to, to move into to Venus and you're importing 
uh, animals and, and insects, would you choose to import mosquitoes? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and, and pathogens? And pathogens and fleas and uh, poison ivy. Uh, you know, the, the temptation to leave a few things behind is pretty strong. So, uh, you know, just, just something to contemplate. But really, if you're going to go part of the way, you might as well go all the way. Because it's, it's not going to make that big a difference in the amount of time and effort that it takes to do it. So I, I view it at, because then if you're going to modify the humans, well now you've got to modify the plants and the animals and the bugs and suddenly you wind up with something that's really, really much more massive, a project, than simply terraforming the planet. So. Yeah, and with an ecology, you're dealing with an incredibly complex system. And you know, the first time you probably won't get it right. Yeah, the first hundred times you won't get it right. Yeah, yeah, probably true. So we know this ecology works, and if we can transport it, you know, pretty much in total, we, we're pretty sure that it will work if we can get everything established. We, we like to, in our work, we like to ask these big questions, and we come up with these seemingly outlandish schemes for really big projects, like, you know, mirrors the size of Texas to deal with climate change and shell worlds, you know, wrapping a balloon around a planet. And, you know, like the name of our workshop, Interstellar Travel, which you look at the energy involved, that is a tall, tall proposition. That's about as hard as those engineering projects. But terraforming, real terraforming, that's harder than that. So by the time the human race gets to a place where they can actually conceive terraforming, I mean, think seriously that they can do it, will be very, will A, will be a lot richer and much more powerful. I think we'll be different people. Well, and we'll be a spacefaring civilization with uh, access yeah. to energies that, you know, we can only imagine today. And uh, Ma'am, I think you had a question? Yes. Well, I was just going back to the choice of, of objectives for terraforming and the, the, the sharp concern that there's no life, not even to use that slime mold. However, one of the things that haven't we picked up from some of the work that's being done on Mars right now is the ubiquity of life. That's, that's an unsubtle question. Uh, there's indications that there, there's something there, but you know, it's, it's not obvious. What? It's not obvious what, what we're dealing with. So maybe yes, maybe no. We, we just, we need hard data. You know, my personal, my intuition is that life wants to emerge and given half a chance it will. Extremophiles on Earth tell us that, okay? Everywhere we look, no matter how crazy, we find life there. You you've know, got the, vent, you know you've got the, the vents, vent colony, nuclear you know, reactors, yeah. all kinds of crazy stuff. So I think life really wants to come out, but you know, it's one thing to have an intuition; it's another thing to go there and find out. And you know, there's another question you raise. You know, the gravity thing. That's another thing we need to answer. That question. That is an important engineering question. It's the most important space engineering question there is. Is how much gravity can human beings do without? And, and we need to quit you, guessing. And you have to look at humans at different stages of life, too, because uh, an embryo, a developing embryo, yep. may require some, and, and our experimentation indicates that it does require something very different from what an adult can withstand. So we need to get to, we need to, get to work on that right now why not start now if you uh, yeah okay okay who back to that sir and the guy in the blue shirt also yeah you so that's the question i'm not hearing here so, okay if you go to the office and all space spirit uh, type of, uh, you know, space stations rather than terrible Well, the, the, the one, that's true, but 
you're assuming that they have the same capability we have right now to communicate between uh, continents. And if you've got somebody that is in Alpha Centauri or further, that's not quite the case. You can pretty much, if you're looking at something like that, at least for the foreseeable future, until we develop something really much more sophisticated than anything that we can currently envision, you're looking at completely independent worlds. But we have examples to, to look at. You know, when the old world found the new world, they established colonies. Uh, the communication lag was, was months, uh, but yet we were able to colonize, yeah, to colonize the, the new world, and, and here, here we are. Uh, would not the same thing happen with uh, interstellar colonies? It, again, it, it's a good question. You know, we don't necessarily have all the answers now, but I think we need to begin to raise the question. The way Isaac Asimov wrote it in The Stars Like Dust, you know, Earth becomes a forgotten backwater, you know, in the days of the Galactic Empire. It is even before the Empire, really, and Earth was already forgotten. But, you know, Charles Sheffield, in his book, Like Cold as Ice, the uh, be asteroid belt and the outer moons revolt, and there's a system war, and, you know, Earth gets pretty much wasted. So I think when people move into space, um, I think that the people living in space are going to become very, very wealthy because there's just so much more energy and material resources to available to them and lots of automation. Automation makes people rich. And I think maybe they'll have an affection for the home and turn it into a park, like a, a theme park or something. Like, go walk under real air, you know, without a... Don't turn Disney loose on it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they might look at the home old world fondly as a place to be, you know, maintained and kept, you know, where we came from. You know, who knows what we'll do. It's well, also, look at, the, at history. Uh, when the old world found the new world and colonized it, you know, it, it did not go away. It, it, it remained very important. And also note that, that there have never been any big wars between the old world and, and the new world. There were revolutions where the New World, you know, threw off, uh, you know, command of the Old World. But the New World really hasn't invaded uh, the Old World or, or vice versa. So, you know, just something for consideration. Okay, one, one more question. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the radiation thing. Is Pardon? Speak up. Okay. Okay. So we go further apart. Yeah. Further apart. Yeah. So we go further apart. Almost like the species. That is more problematic. I think on the I think on the time scale you you would be envisioning there, we would be able to repair that. The yeah, because you're looking, you're looking at. Well, and also we would be able to control it. Uh, you know, the transhuman panel. Uh, we're, that that's another yeah. panel at uh, another time. But yeah, we're we're getting to the point where we can control our own biological destiny, as as a race. One of Ken's insights that not too many people have, it's, it's really made me think. People think when you go to another world, it's just going to go evolve on its own track and. You know, just they'll just completely go their own way. But you know, look at us now. We got these widgets, and everybody on the eighty percent of the people on this planet are going to have a smartphone within five years. And this is, as my friend Drew says, Robert, that's not a phone; that's a computer. So, people actually, even the ones who go to Alpha Centauri, they're going to be plugged into what's happening in Hollywood, like as if that's important. But you know, who knows what people are like. They'll be able to stay in the loop yeah. on social media. It's it, it only a four-year delay. delay. Well, yeah, but that's still a four-year delay. Well, but it's not a complete, you know, it's not a gulf. No. And no. within the solar system, where light travel is minutes. The minutes, hours, days. Everybody's going to be in touch. Yeah, yeah. So, so rethink it. I mean, he Yeah, the, the cultural that. drift within the solar system is probably going to be fairly minor 
and you can probably control uh, the cultural and genetic g uh, drift between, between star systems if you're in communication. And certainly by the time we get to the point where we can travel readily between star systems, I would think if, if, if we ever have, for instance, um, a warp drive, Al Kubier or otherwise, um, you can start playing some games with generating a warp that you can shoot your communications through. So th you, there, there, there are conceivable ways to speed up the communication. Yeah, there are theories out there, I guess, now for FTL communication. I'm not sure if they're they're valid or not, but you know, people are starting to talk about that idea. So quantum entanglement. Yeah, things and, like that. You know, so. maybe yes, maybe no, but yeah, yeah it, it may be that uh, we can talk to our Alpha Centauri Thanks. colony pretty much in real time, which you know, that, that that'd be an interesting idea. And actually, we're wearing proof that that uh, interstellar travel there might be a time dilation effect because. Uh, we're wearing T-shirts from the future, so <laughs> 2016. What? Oh yeah, okay. Didn't notice that. Okay. Black hat. Um, you guys at one point mentioned that the sterile or, uh, systems in our solar system are uh, have no magnetic fields around them. Is there a way to restart somehow that magnetic field other than to start the core spinning again? Probably not, but there are ways to create artificial magnetic fields, but we have just run out of time, so I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed LibertyCon. Thank you.